This is the Loaded Radio Podcast. All right, thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Loaded Radio Podcast. And I'm Scott Penfold from Loaded Radio. And uh, this week, it's a special one as we're going to be going a full 30 minutes. Yeah, doing the full 30 with a couple of guys from the band Monuments. Yeah, we're going to be talking with John Brown and Mike Melian from uh, just a great British progressive metal band. And uh, they've been around since 2007. Their fourth studio album, In Stasis, is dropping this month, which features Mick Gordon as co-producer with Spencer. Spencer Sotelo from Periphery and ex-vocalist Nima Ascari as guests too. So a very strong release from the guys in Monuments. And it's a band who've had a lot of personnel changes. I mean, over the years, they've had quite a few members come and go. But uh, they seem to have settled on a pretty strong core of four players right now. So let's get right down to talking to these two. Here they are. I am talking to where I'm connected to, I believe, right now. I'm connected to Mike Malian right now. Mike, how you doing, dude? Dude, really good. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I'm a bit late. The last interview I had just ran a few minutes late, though. John, are you with us? I am with you. Awesome, Mr. Cobb. <laughs> oh, man. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Dude. I was waiting in the waiting room, so I just called Mike quickly to let me in. Oh, yeah. Man. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I took a sip of coffee and then Mother Nature did what she does best in <laughs> you when you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It's, it's great to have both you guys here uh, with, with me today. And, uh, and Stasis just sounds killer, man. Uh, I think this is going to be solid release, guys, and uh, great work. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much you, man. I haven't heard the whole record yet. Only I've heard about four tunes. Dang. Okay, perfect. That's yeah. four. That's more than more than some people have heard. Oh, that we've it? had some interviews. <laughs> yeah, with. yeah, yeah. Got to thank you so much for taking. The yeah, time. thanks for <laughs> taking the time. You know what? Let's just dive right into the album first off. Now, um, I know that uh, that Mike, you did some of the production uh, with John, of course, and Andy Sizek. Uh, how did you guys find working together in a production sense with the album? I think it was a really interesting process. We were hot off the heels of a massive, massive lineup change with our guitarist leaving. So I kind of had this kind of pressure on me to go be like, well, now the only instrumental writers are me and Brown. And <laughs> I kind of just want to be there to support him and uh, help him to feel like his ideas are, are there. There were a lot of tunes that I think he thought were terrible and thrown out. And one of them was Cardinal Red. Oh, really? Andy helped, <laughs> Andy helped bring that out of the bin. Andy was great with that as well. It was just an entirely new process that had uh, shadow of how we used to feel when we very first started writing together in 2010. Um, but it was just a, deve- it felt like a development of a very old process from a yeah. completely different point in our lives. Um, and yeah, it's just been a really interesting difference, but um, yeah, I think it, we just kind of let it become whatever it wants to be. We just let it yeah. take control, didn't we? I think that with the producing side of it, it was more, I think that when you write individually, you get inside your own head and think everything's a bit shit, which (laughs) definitely happens to me with every single song. And I think it happens to most people if they listen to something too many times. So with um, everyone getting involved in the producing side of it, it meant that, you know, people's ideas could be come to the table and anything when, but also it stopped us from really giving us an opportunity to think about whether or not something was good or bad. If, you know, if two people liked it, then it stayed. If two people didn't like it, then we changed it up. Yeah. There was only one point where we had like, uh, we had a veto on like two people. We were both about one thing, but Andy was really against it. So we were like, well, we'll give you this one because you can't get over it, but we're going to take another one later. Oh, okay. It was like that <laughs> time. It so was really like currency. Yeah. Oh, do you remember? Exactly. It, was, it was the makeshift intro. He couldn't get into oh, it. Oh, yeah, no, it was. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He, so, and yeah. he was like, and we were like, well, you can't, no, we can't lose that intro. It, it, I think his song idea would have been good, but we couldn't connect with it. So, uh, but we but we really took it seriously. We were like, basically what Mike's trying to say is an uber geek and (laughs) he finds every single way to make things cool. (laughs) <laughs> I'm just obsessive. I'm just an obsessive personality. I always have been. It's what brought me to Brown. I think he's, I think it's what brought me to Gent in general and just musicians who are 
who have obsessive tendencies. I just fucking can't get enough of it. And then the only difference really, the big difference is that I just will, yeah, I just talk way too much as well, which is great. Yeah. You know? we, oh, it's great for interviews, man. Makes it easy. So do just <laughs> shut me up if, if you just want me to stop talking on the subject that I'm just going in circles. You know, it's, it's, it's all good, guys. You know, I did want to talk about the song Cardinal Red. You just brought it up, though. What can you guys tell me about that song? I think it's killer first off. Uh, what can you guys tell me about its creation, its origins? The initial ideas for that were actually used for a competition over at Riff Hard. Oh, really? So, yeah. Yeah, I wrote, I, it took me 10 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating, 10 minutes to write the initial riffs for that. And what happened was I think I had two or three riffs, gave it to publicly to everyone to write their own song out of it, and at the end they'd win a guitar. Okay. Oh, cool. And then I went on a second, I went on a live stream to finish the song every, after a bunch of people said, you know, I really like this song. I want, I want to finish it. Um, so I got up onto live stream on YouTube and I got the song to about 90, 95% of where it ended up. And I, I, you know, cause I'd written it in such a short amount of time. I was like, there's no way this song's good because I haven't put the time into it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I said, I thought it was just a bin song, but then Andy was like, no, this song's great. And then from there, me, Mike and Andy produced it to where it was now. Like the chorus completely changed its chord progression, for example. Um, so that's kind of how it started. It started as a few riffs for a competition at my teaching website, Riffard, and then went on a live stream, wrote a bunch more, and then we deep dived into it after Andy wrote some vocals for it. It came out really, really well. I, I think it's, a, it's such a strong tune, too. It's, it was great out the gate. Another great one that definitely caught me was False Providence. Uh, but can you tell me about that one? That is my favorite on the record, and I'm going to let Mike take over from there. <laughs> we, yeah. we nearly didn't make that a single, but it was actually George Lever and Mick Gordon who were basically they were they were our uh, the ones working on it that weren't the the primary musicians, shall we say, not in the band. But they said that this is the best song on the record. Uh, I think Mick said Mick and George. I think George said it was his favorite Monument song that had ever been written. He was like, if you don't make that a single, I'm going to yeah. fucking slap you. Um, <laughs> and and so we we were going to go with a song called Opiate, I think. Um, and it was it was a tough call, but they were so into that one that it was like, all right, well, let's just see what happens with that. And it's worked out like so wonderfully. But yeah, it used to be called Stoic as a working title. Oh, yes. It was an old so, one for you, wasn't it? It was in your writing banks from no, years no, ago. It was, it was actually quite new, that one. Oh. That one was one of the new ones. Yeah. So that okay. song was originally called Stoic. Yeah. And it was about, um, so often or not, I'll write to certain briefs because I can't just write music. It needs to have like... Uh, I grew up on a lot of film music and I absolutely love Hans Zimmer. So I like connecting music to situations or stories because cool. it makes it way easier to write then because you have a narrative that you can follow, you know, like um, I know that the minor key is going to sound sad, for example, or the major key is going to sound happy. So that having like a brief gives me sort of like a place that I can go. I know that it's going to be somewhere here, and I'm not going to be overwhelmed by the infinite possibilities that's possible with music. Um, so yeah, that originally started as the word stoic, that song, and it was written about how to be able to live in this world, you kind of have to be emotionless. And it was kind of inspired by the film Equilibrium, if you've ever seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good yeah. film. Um, so then from that, Andy took that theme and turned it into his sort of version of what that meant to him. Wow. So that's kind of how that song started. And it ended up being about, you know, um, believing in something so strongly that when that belief changes, the entire world around you is shattered. Well, wow. that's the premise of that song. It's a powerful tune, man. And, and another great song, too. Our essence, we had Spencer from Periphery. Uh, how did he get involved? Uh, I'll let Mike answer this one. Yeah, <laughs> see, that, was, that was where Andy basically had written in gaps, uh, you know, because he we, he had complete control of, of what was going on vocally. And he'd kind of written it in and suggested, like, should we get, you know, some guests on board? And we were like, yeah, who who would be the number one for you? And it, it, it didn't even take him like two seconds to reply with it's Spencer. Oh, really? Uh, basically, <laughs> basically, he he's, a, you know, Spencer's been a huge influence on Andy. And so it was a dream come true for him. Me and Brown have both filled in for periphery at various points in our lives when yeah. uh, members have had injuries. So we had this great 
connection with with Spencer, um, you know, decent decent friends. And we and, and I just kind of wrote him. I was like, it was kind of like when Brown asked Mick, we just wrote him a message like, do you want to do the thing? He was like, I'll do the thing. Yeah, uh, it's like so. Which for most people would be like, what the fuck do you mean? You just gave him a message. It was like, do you want to do it? He's like, yeah. It's like, but that literally is just what it was like with both Mick and. and and with uh, with with Spencer as well, so yeah, and also Nima really well. as well. Yeah, yeah, Nima. Yeah. I was going to say Nima came back. How did that? Yeah, happen? well, he was pushing me for like he was like, do any of your friends want uh, want a vocalist to feature with? And it really reminded me of when he where he was at when we were doing <clears throat> when we were working on Gnosis together those early days, and yeah. he was doing all those covers for like Tesseract and Chimp Spanner and stuff. I just remember right. that he was putting all this out of effort and energy into. Either, you know, he's sometimes just doing vocals to songs that didn't have vocals. He just wanted to just really wanted to connect with people. He had a first for doing it. And I was seeing this return back in him and he was like, I really just want to do it. Do you know anyone? And then I was thinking, I kind of like to ask him, I need to chat to the guys about it. And then when Andy brought this up, like I've got this other spot for this other song, who else do you think? I was like, well, Neem's kind of wanting to do it. And, you know, things are cool. <laughs> it would be such a sick way to like, and now it's a sandwich. The first thing we ever released and yeah. the last thing that now <laughs> that we've released, both have him on it, which is fucking wicked. Like it's just, and, you know, he, it's a huge part of what made Fell Silent, Fell Silent, um, you know, and it's just great to have that energy that was su- such a prevalent fighting founding feature of what made our band like, I don't know what made it work in the beginning to have that featured in. And then it also accidentally then ended up being on the initial song, which is now extra awesome because it's like, <laughs> yeah. it, I, you know, an album kind of sets a tone on that first one. So it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. I think it's just wicked. Such Certainly cool so. And, and, you know, like Nemo, of course, we talked about who's used to be in the band. Why do you think there's been so many lineup changes thus far with Monuments? Oh, we're I just think, a bunch of assholes. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I kind of like, I think it comes down to t- two different things, actually. So the first thing is, is if you're in an enclosed space for an eight week tour, for example, yeah, it's like being married to that person. And if you don't get on with them, like absolutely 100% or you don't resolve issues in the moments, then that's going to manifest into something negative. So that is definitely what happened with some of those situations, not all, but some. And then the other thing is, is I think there's people's priorities in life just change. You know, if you've been in a band for X amount of years and, you know, you want to try something different, it's like, you know, we, we as humans get bored of, doing the same thing day in, day out, you know, repetitiveness just isn't in some of our, you know, it's not something that some of us want to do all the time. So I think that it's a combination of, you know, making sure that you get along with someone really, really well, and they're willing to devote their life to it. But, you know, people can change. People always change. I've definitely changed in the last 12 years, you know, Um, and, you know, it's a shame that you can't have the same people all the time in the same band, but it happens nearly to every single band. It's very rare that the same bands have the same founding members in these days anyway. Right. And well, how, how do you, how are you finding John, the current lineup of the band? Do you see this as, as a solid unit currently? Oh yeah. I mean, Andy is fucking great. Like uh, he actually inspired me to write this record truthfully he yeah. was the one pushing um, the hardest he was the one who made us sit down yeah. and listen to those demos oh really um, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he, he was the one who was yeah. fighting and, and then actually he's just making an effort of telling brown this is great this is the one i want you to work on next send it to me when it's done it was so powerful yeah. it was like there was no option to send him a half-finished idea it was like don't send it to me until it's done i'm gonna keep nagging you for it until i get it Wow! It was yeah, amazing. It was it was actually fucking annoying in many ways. But yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> but like you sure know, when you spend that much time with someone, like on a bus in life, you know, you get to like I know what Brown's farts smell like. I don't have to ask. <laughs> but the question is, how much? How can is that fart cool with you? Like, can you live with that fart? That's and a good point. That's <laughs> a very solid and, point, and, man. I, now I know Andy's farts. I'm fucking. I, they're great. They're good. I can I can deal with it. Um, it's all Brown's about the bowels, friend, isn't yeah. it? It really is. Yeah, dude. Yeah, they just get, you got to keep your bowels in order. If you're not keeping your bowels in order. 
order, then it's like not keeping your life in order. Yeah, like you stay off the like, tour bus. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, just fucking, yeah. Don't, you know. Just <laughs> but no, like, it's out. funny because when, when we first got Andy in, we actually did it as a fill-in because I think that's actually more important than anything else that you get on with them like 100%. There's nothing wrong. Certainly. And I wish it was kind of a lesson that I learned earlier, to be honest, because if... I was going to redo everything. So say we go back till even before fell silent, I would probably choose the people that I get on with best that maybe weren't as good as the, their instruments at the beginning, yeah. because and I, I would suggest this to any band, choose the person that you get well, uh, get on well with the most in a confined space, because you can always get better at your instrument, but you can't change someone's personality. And you'd mentioned that there, there are a lot of bands out there these days that have been having lineup changes. I'm seeing so many bands that I've interviewed, especially in the last, I'd say, couple of years where th these people don't even communicate and they don't even like each other. It's like showing up for work and punching a clock. And I just I yeah. couldn't imagine doing that with someone I didn't like, you know? I think that that can happen over many years as well, though. Like you could love someone in the beginning and then certainly you don't fix a problem. And you know, it, it happens to every single one of us. I mean, how, how many lifelong friends does anyone have? Yeah. It's, for, it, it's weird that the public never see this side of it either. They've obviously been in these situations before. It's not that, you know, I obviously don't hate anyone. Mm -hmm. Like I wish everyone that's been in this band previously the, the absolute best. And I really do mean that from the bottom of my heart. And, you know, I'm not saying that everyone left because we didn't get on, you know, as I said, people's priorities in life change, but you can't expect a, a, a group of people to constantly get on. It's just not real life. No, <laughs> you course. know? Yeah. So the human um, condition always takes precedence, of course. Yeah. yeah I mean, this really does either. feel like monuments now. Like this yeah. is foundationally like where we start from as a consistent unit. I really feel like anyway. Well, that, yeah, yeah, everyone gets on and there's no bullshit anymore. We just tell each other when we're pissing each other off. Yeah. yeah. You know? This well, that's, the the, you know, that's therapeutic, man. That's the way to do it. I mean, and even like you, you Mike, you left the band back in 2015. You came back in 2020. What happened there? I, I did. I had a massive, massive injury um, that spanned over my shoulder, uh, tore a tendon, and I tore the labrum in my left hip socket. Mm -hmm. um, and oh. I was like, I can never do metal again. So I'm not going to take a time out. I don't want these guys waiting for me. In hindsight, if you if I'd presented that to you as an option, we were all kind of fucked from the amount of touring we were doing. Yeah. You probably would have taken the time out and worked it out with me. But at that moment, I just needed to get out of it. I was hurting too much. I had this really bad um, cycle with uh, hurting myself more, the worse I got. Uh, it was a silly, silly thing, but self-loathing tide. I had lots of therapy, feeling much better now. Back then when I left, I was like, I never again to metal drumming in general. Uh, and But I managed to get over it and, uh, you know, got some therapy, felt good. When the opportunity came to come back to the band, the band seemed to be doing a lot better, a lot more positively. Uh, and I think looking back on it, Andy was a big part of that as well. Um, and other factors, you know, everyone just felt like it just felt like everything I ever wanted it to be back then. And I was better. And I, you know, some of my more toxic traits were kind of a bit behind me as well. We'd all healed, become looked after our home situations a bit more. And That's it was tough. just like, and it was just a fucking no brainer. I remember Swanee called me. I was in the car somewhere in Poland, I think. And it was just like, yeah, I fucking want to do that again. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, as I say, like, I, I also think, you know, me and Mike have actually had our, you know, I've definitely said some pretty horrible things to Mike over the years. And oh, I have, likewise, I have, yeah, we've I have apologized so <laughs> profusely because obviously, you know, things that happen in, in moments doesn't mean it always has to be like that. You know, you just, you know, that's what we do. We, we fight, we quarrel, and then we make up again. And yeah, then yeah. that's, that's the important part there, of course, that you make up again at the end. I mean, because you guys just have such a strong album right now, Look like how much it's paying off. I mean, I, this is, uh, I think this is definitely going to be a landmark album for you guys. It's just, from what I've heard, at least so far, it sounds just, it's killer, man. It's great. Thank you so much, Scott. I can't wait for my Porsche Taycan to be on my driveway. <laughs> from <laughs> <laughs> this is when you get banned from every Holiday Inn in fucking in the world, right? <laughs> yeah, man. From actually, this in. is the second intro, it, it, the second interview I've talked about a Porsche uh, Taycan or Taycan, whatever it's called. Manifest, I'm, yeah. I'm manifesting yeah. this electric car. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, really quickly from each of you, please, three influential, rather, metal albums to you personally and why, please, gentlemen. Oh, wow. That is difficult. Mm, mm-hmm. As in like current or lo- lifelong? Anytime, and- any metal of all a- at all. Well, Immutable, the new Meshuggah album, is actually up there as probably my favorite record. Great call. It's a great album. Right yeah. now, it's yep. fucking sick. Like, it's it grooving like a motherfucker in a way that I've always... There's songs of Meshuggahs that groove so well. So mm-hmm. Most albums have a good few of them. But then it goes to this place that I can't connect with, which is that kind of Holdsworthy fucking chaos that I just kind of go, eh, you lost me. And that's a me problem. <laughs> but this one is like they've tuned it and in my direction, obviously, they do their thing. And I'm just, I just fucking love this one in a way that I haven't loved others as much. And that's saying a lot because I love them all. So that's Absolutely. one for me. I'll bat it to Brown for one of his three. Yeah, John, I mean, go yeah, ahead. Just it is, it's an amazing album for me when it comes to Sugar. I have to go by the album that really got me into them, which was Nothing. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I listened to them before that and I didn't really get it. And I, the first song I heard was Sane on chaos fear which obviously i love chaos fear now but nothing straws pulled at random when i was listening to that album i was also watching lord of the rings so that moment at the end of that song just reminds me of when they light the beacons in lord of the rings so for me that album always brings me to a point back in my life when i first got into them so that's definitely one of my favorite albums of all time great call yeah mike number two for you me, uh, I'm going to just throw my two and three because these are childhood ones that I wouldn't be doing what I was doing without them. It, it's kind of hard. I, I want to do uh, Slipknot self-titled as a 12-year-old yeah, and change yes. my life. Lamb of God as Ashes of the Wake changed my fucking life a little bit more and I got, I got massively obsessed with that. And I will just throw Periphery's early stuff in general as another major landmark moment that led me into basically doing this kind of stuff and making it like, yeah, this is the, now it's tuned perfectly. Uh, yeah. I know that was three, but I've haven't said anything about the three of them. Basically. Yeah. You know what? So John, you're going to get four now as well. Then if you want, buddy, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Right. So my second one would be iron dissonance and it's really difficult to pick one album here. So it's a real, it's a tie between breathing is irrelevant and solace. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, in fact, even minus the herd can go on there. If it, just one of those three, I can't decide because it's too difficult. All three are great for different reasons. Um, I'm just trying to rack my brain around the millions of metal albums that I love right now. Um, very difficult. Met- uh, Metallica has to be up there as well. For me, like it's puppets? probably... I think it would probably be Puppets, yeah. yeah. Um, especially live in 89 in Seattle. The videos that are on YouTube are just absolutely in fucking sane yeah um that album was life-changing to me and i've pretty much copied hetfield ever since (laughs) (laughs) anybody in any metal band i've ever asked this question to they've named master puppets by metallica it's such a prominent album yeah and that one and then as far as uh one more i mean there's a fucking million that i could name right now Uh, i'm just racking through my cd collection at home you were really Um, into fair to midland weren't you it's not is it really metal uh, yeah, good point. Good point I mean, yeah. I would definitely put arrows and anchors at the top there. As in fact, you know what? We'll stick with that. In fact, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Really good album. One of my favorites, but it's not metal. Is really? it? It's kind of rock, isn't it? Have you never heard Fair to Midland Star? No, I don't think I have. Oh my God. Put on arrows and anchors. It's absolute musical genius. I will check it out. My brother. Definitely, man. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that is musical genius to me. Um, I'm just thinking about what um, I'm going through all my vinyl collection yeah. in my head right now. So um, it's such a difficult question to name it. Only four. I know. Uh, it is. <laughs> I'm actually going to say the Dillinger escape plan. Good call. Mm. Great. Yeah, they played a really big role in a, a lot of what I listened to. Um, so I'm going to say it's probably Miss Machine. Yeah. I've, or, I've, yeah. Mm, Irony is a dead scene, though. Another great album. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's only an EP, though, isn't it? So let's go with Miss Machine because Panasonic Youth is on there. You awesome dude you got it you know what guys this has been a, a, a real street talking to you guys i really hope to see you over here in canada soon oh yeah we actually have something booked and it'll be announced soon yeah oh yeah, fantastic assuming, assuming it happens we'll i think we're, we're coming by your door uh fingers crossed yeah. keep an eye out for it if you don't hear about it it means it was never going to happen because covid sucks but if it does happen <laughs> it's a chance we'll, if you hear about it chances are it's actually going to happen i'll come say hi to you guys happen. 
if it does happen, I'm going to Tim Hortons and getting a red velvet muffin. Oh, I'm, I'm drinking a Tim Hortons coffee right now. I'm not joking. There's <laughs> yeah. actually a Tim Hortons right by my studio now, and it's drive through. I've heard oh, that, yeah. that, that Tim Hortons is over there now. That's great. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. All right. Thanks again, gents. We'll talk to you soon. All the best. Thanks, See you guys. Care, Thank you very much. There they are. That's John and Mike from Monuments, and the new album is called In Stasis. It is arriving April 15th, and uh, it is a strong, strong release, man. I mean, features Mick Gordon in there from Doom, Killer Instinct, and Prey as co producer. You got uh, Spencer from Periphery in there, and of course, ex vocalist Nima Ascari in there, too. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's an all around great metalcore, progressive, whatever you want to call it. It's a straight up great album. As always, don't forget, you can get all the info you need when it comes to hard rock and metal at LoadedRadio.com, constantly updated with your hard rock and metal news, plus the 24-hour digital quality high-end radio station. That's there for you as well. And don't forget to download the Loaded Radio app where you get all that stuff, plus these podcasts right to your device. All right? We'll talk to you again next week on an all-new edition of the Loaded Radio podcast. I'm Scott Penfold from Loaded Radio. Loaded Radio.